In these clips, we see U.S. fighters attacking German trains with their machine guns. Destroying transportation networks and vehicles were critical in disrupting the flow of troops, goods, armaments, and supplies. The intent of this video is to review tactics, lessons learned, guidelines, and the impact attacking trains had on the Allied war effort. The fighters from the 8th Air Forces alone claimed some 4,600 locomotives destroyed by war's end. I combed through hours of archival combat footage splicing around 6 minutes of train strafing attack snippets. At the end of the video, we will view 50 or so train strafing attacks. Train destruction priority ranking is described on this page from a declassified 1945 Headquarters 65th Fighter Command 8th Air Forces document titled FLAC, Light, Intense, and Accurate. The number one priority of the 8th Air Forces is the destruction of the German Air Force. The number two priority is the destruction of the German transportation system including trains, road vehicles, canal boats, and barges. Ground strafing started in March of 1944 when fighters who had finished their bomber relay escort duties would pick out trains and barges as targets of opportunity on the return trip back to base. U.S. pilots were not adequately trained in the techniques of ground strafing as discussed in this 66 fighter wing document titled The History of the 8th USAAF Fighter Command. The first organized pilot strafing training in sortie started in March 1944, where 16 pilots were trained in ground strafing tactics. The group was called Bill's Buzz Boys after General William Kepner of the 8th Air Force's Fighter Command. This page outlines the group's scorecard for the six strafing missions in March and April 1944. They destroyed 13 aircraft on the ground, 18 locomotives, later credited to 20, and in addition they shot up 8 black towers, a water tower, a staff car, 7 soldiers, and others. The cost was 3 P-47s destroyed and 13 damaged, all due to flak. This photograph shows members of Bill's Buzz Boys and a chalkboard showing the results of their attacks. The P-47 is recognized as the best U.S. ground strafing fighter since it packed more firepower than the P-51 or P-38, and its air-cooled engine could sustain more battle damage than the liquid-cooled P-51 or P-38. This bar chart shows the number of P-47s, P-38s, and P-51s operational by the 8th Air Forces by month and year from a 1945 8th Air Force tactical development document. In March of 1944, when Bill's Buzz Boys started strafing operations, the 8th Air Forces had 425 Thunderbolts, 155 Lightnings, and 150 Mustangs. Depending on the model, P-47s were armed with either 6 or 8 Browning M2 machine guns, as defined in the September 1945 AAF Air Service Technical Command document titled Tactical Planning. Each gun was fed by 267 belted cartridges. The guns were staggered to facilitate ease of ammo feeding. Each gun's rate of fire equated to around 750 rounds per minute as defined in this 1945 United States Strategic Bombing Survey report titled Armaments in the Air War. The P-47 could deliver around 21 seconds of continuous fire. Although as discussed in previous videos, best to fire short one second burst with a cooling off period between the shots to minimize bullet strike group size, reduce the likelihood of cartridge cook-off, and to conserve ammo. The effective range of the P-47's machine guns are listed on this page from a 1945 Army Air Forces Training Command document titled Fighter Gunnery. The effective range is out to 1,200 feet or 400 yards. A fighter cannot strike aerial targets consistently beyond this distance. This also applies to ground targets which require dense concentrations of fire like trains. The many reasons why 400 yards was selected as a maximum effective range is discussed in this channel's video. It's related to the gun to gun sight harmonization, accuracy losses, bullet pattern dispersion grouping, loss of bullet penetrating power, and aerodynamic forces acting on the bullet. Fighter ammo type combat results are discussed on this page from a September 1944 Headquarters 19th Tactical Air Command document titled 19th Tactical Air Command's First Month of Operations in Support of the Third Army in France. P-47s have been successful in machine gun strafing trains, horse-drawn carts, and armored vehicles. The armor-piercing incendiary cartridge is more effective than the old standard ammo belt repeating mix of two armor-piercing, two incendiary, and a tracer. This mix is best for air-to-air -air and air-to-ground attacks. All fighters are to be issued 100% armor-piercing incendiary cartridge ammo belts. This page evaluates the P-47 when used as a ground attack fighter bomber. It has good handling characteristics in flight, takeoff, and landings. Its large nose, though, limits visibility when attacking ground targets. Pilots require training and practice to overcome this limitation. The plane should not be used for dive bombing given its inability to pull out from a dive. 
This page from a 1945 Air Force manual titled Fighter Gunnery, Rocket Firing, and Dive Bombing outlines pilot cockpit forward visibility obstructions of various U.S. fighters. The P-47's visibility relative to the gun sight pipper is shaded. These posters provide guidelines when attacking ground targets. Do not attack trains lengthwise. Do not pull up after an attack. This page provides a rationale for attacking trains at a 90 degree angle. It will reduce CAA gunner's accuracy by increasing his deflection. This applies to a moving train and also allows for a fast getaway. You may want to target the train's flat cars first at longer distances to discourage them from targeting you. This image shows a German camouflaged rail car containing light autocannon flat guns. A quad mount 38mm AA gun is in the rail car. The sides and roofs can be removed. The gun can be ready for action in seconds. This image shows rail flat cars containing triple 20mm autocannons protected by a 3 foot thick concrete wall. This image shows armored rail cars protected by both small AA and large caliber guns. A quad 20mm autocannon light flat AA gun mounted on the roof of a rail car. Derailed armored rail cars. Additional tips regarding ground strafing tactics are shown on this page from an August 1945 Army Air Forces Evaluation Board document titled the effectiveness of the third phase tactical operations in the European theater. The fighter bomber armament is effective against ground transport. For accuracy, a fighter must optimize the attack angle. Accurate strikes are a challenge if the dive angle is too steep or too shallow. If too steep, the pilot will usually open fire too far away as he needs to account for the distance needed to execute a dive pull up. If too shallow, he will struggle to both maintain focus on the target and potential collision obstacles. A 15 degree dive angle is considered optimum. The attack approach is also dependent on the level of flak protection and element of surprise. If the target has been alerted to your attack, then attack the target at a slightly steeper angle where the plane will open fire at its maximum speed. Start the attack run in a steep dive from an altitude of four to 5,000 feet. Long burst fire is not recommended nor economical. Flak positions may be attacked to neutralize them prior to target strafing. Additional lessons learned from strafing trains are listed on this page from a December 1944 AAF School of Applied Tactics document titled Offensive Fighter Aviation in the TAF. Stationary trains may be a trap. Investigate prior to attack. Decoy flak trains emit steam alerting allied fighters to their location, but they may be protected by 16 light flak guns. Moving trains are easy targets. Attack in a high-speed dive approaching 90 degrees to the train's axis. The following flight of fighters should be 4 to 6 seconds behind the first attackers. Most German trains are protected by light flak guns, which are usually hidden until they open fire. If they open fire, the second following flight should target the rail car's AA guns, while the first flight targets the train's engine and other rail cars. It is ineffective to attack coal cars. The incendiary ammo could not make them burn. If the cars may carry ammunition, open fire from longer distances. Over two dozen fighters have been lost from these types of explosions. The number of fighters lost from flak are listed on this table for the 65th Fighter Wing for the date ranges of July 4, 1943 to May 8, 1945. Of the 192 fighters lost, 75 occurred while strafing heavily defended airfields and 14 while strafing trains. Those losses while strafing trains are likely due to the train's AA guns. So how effective were fighters in attacking trains? This table lists a number of ground targets claimed destroyed by 8th Air Force fighters. 4,660 locomotives, 1,500 oil tank cars, 20 trains, 6,069 wagons and rail cars. This table provides a more detailed target list for the 65th Fighter Wing. Interesting categories include horses, 12, German soldiers, 386, damage to a 40-foot yacht, 3 B-17s that belly landed in exits control territories, four fishing boats, and three tractors. This page discusses the effect fighter strafing had on Germany's ability to move goods from a June 1945 AAF Evaluation Board document titled Effectiveness of Air Attacks Against Rail Transportation in the Battle of France. This map shows France's targeted rail system. The Allies concentrated their efforts to strafe German trains to support the D-Day invasion. All rolling stocks and support structure were targets. 500 sorties were dispatched on May 21, 1944 to seek and destroy these targets. This is known as Chattanooga Day. 113 locomotives were damaged. Another effort was made in the two weeks prior to D-Day where 475 more locomotives were damaged by fighter strafing. Trains were trapped by cut rail lines. Then the trapped trains were attacked by strafing. 
Fueled belly tanks could be dropped on the trains and then set on fire by strafing the fuel with the API rounds. This had a negative effect on train personnel. Germans needed to man the trains on the more dangerous runs. The effect on rail traffic was immediate. Five days after Chattanooga Day, trains ran during reduced day operations. Night travel doubled on routes through Nord. Nord is shaded here on the map. Fear of strafing was an important consideration in running trains. Train strafing had an effect in both destroying or damaging trains and causing fear in the train operators. This graph outlines a number of French rail car loadings for the first seven months of 1944 on a weekly basis. The number of cars peaked at 190,000 in mid-February 1944, down to 60,000 by D-Day, a 68% reduction in traffic. Okay, now let's kick back, open a cold one, and enjoy some train strafing. Couple things to consider and look for. The fighter attacking varies from the P-47, P-38, or P-51. The P-38 strike grouping will be tight since its guns are mounted in the nose and the barrels are not towed in like the P-47 and P-51. They are only slightly tipped up to harmonize with the gun sight accounting for the bullet's gravity drop. The P-38 is considered a more accurate fighter. All of these first clips are from P-38. It seems in most of the clips, the fighter open fires too far away as the bullet strike groupings are large. This can be ascertained by the bullet strike flashes. If the bullet is either incendiary or armor-piercing incendiary, it will flash when it strikes a target. Some of the clips do show tracers that are within the ammo mix. Most of the clips follow the guidelines of attacking the trains perpendicular to their direction of travel and target the train's boiler. Once a boiler is struck, a plume of steam is well visible. Some of the cars contain explosive or flammable material based on the explosions that follow the attack. These attacks are likely from P-47 since two bullet streams converge ahead of the plane. If the train is stationary, then okay to attack lengthwise. If two tracer-laced bullet streams are visible, then the fighter attacking could either be the P-47 or P-51. These bullets are showing erratic behavior. They may be tumbling in flight. A bullet will tumble if the barrel becomes too hot. The pilot needs to account for a cool-down period between bursts. Back to better strike groupings. A boiler breach in this attack. A dangerous explosion with flying debris. Another dangerous explosion. Flying through the debris field can be catastrophic.
the fighter is attacking the train in a very shallow dive. I hope you found the video informative, interesting, and worthy of your time.